find a capacity difficulty, or how does that work if, if you keep getting influxes like these and eventually you must reach some kind of capacity? And you're exactly right, and, and that is a problem that we, that we have to look out for. We have to know when to say when, mm -hmm. um, and you, you, know, you, you can't help them all the time. You do the best that you possibly can. But a lot of times, a show like this that we're doing, mm -hmm. we will probably get calls from people that will say, hey, how do we become foster parents? So we add to it all the okay. time, yeah. you know, and what we try to do is get some of the newer people involved as quickly as we can. And, you know, and some people, they love it. Other people, you know, they do it. They, you know, puppies are a lot of work. They're cute. They're adorable, but they're a lot of work. Sure. I can't do this anymore. I see. Um, you know, so that, that's kind of how we go. But we try to get all the new people involved and, and uh, uh, don't wear out our old timers, so to speak. Sure. You know, and, uh, and get the new ones involved and, uh, and see how they... They enjoy it, and you know, in many cases, it's such a, a rewarding experience that they tell their relatives, they tell their friends, and we we start picking up new people. We do little orientations, um, you know, because not everybody can have a pregnant dog at home and give sure. birth. Not everybody can bottle feed puppies and such, and work schedules. And what we what we want people to do is feel comfortable with what you know. We don't want you to take anything you're not going to feel comfortable with. And so, so that brings up another question: Is is uh, so? Let's say uh, I'm I'm just a guy listening to that you say and may may call in. What is, is there a certain thing that I have to do to kind of qualify to become a foster uh, parent for Suncoast? Yeah, exactly. First, we have you sign up sign up as a volunteer. You have to do an application. Uh, we'll have a little orientation on that. You decide that what you would prefer to do is fostering. Um, one of the things we find out how many animals you have at home. We have your vet records checked. Um, we sit and we talk with you. We have, a, a, again, an orientation on fostering, what we can expect because not everything's going to go, you know, not everything's going to be rosy. There's, there can be problems involved mm -hmm. with it and, and such and, yeah. and uh, how we deal with that and how you deal with that. And, uh, sure. And, uh, uh, you know, and we've been doing this a long time so we can get a pretty good feel yeah. of who we're dealing with and, and how they're going to react in a situation like this. So they're, so they're you know, effectively screened kind of just exactly. to make sure there's no kind of red or even pink flags that go up and Right. These people, well, we should we should have them uh, foster them. Right. Time and, you know, and yeah. sometimes a w couple days into it, we find there's a problem, uh, you know, and we may have to pull the animals from them and say sorry, you know. Hmm. But uh, that doesn't happen very often. Most people are real good. The biggest problem we have with the fosters is wanting to adopt. Well, that that not being able to release yeah. them, you know. Yeah. Well, that that sort of brings me because I just thought, you know, I was going to ask you sort of what the prospects uh, of adoption were. Again, let's just sort of follow this this path with the mm -hmm. 51 that came in. So, yeah, w what percentage of, of people who are fostering the 51, based on your, you know, many, many years of experience, are going to say, you know what, I know I'm just supposed to be fostering this guy or this gal, but I'd like to adopt. Is that just... It, it happens all the time. We, we don't promote it. Now, we do say the foster parent always has first right to adopt. And, uh, but you know what, you can really help us more by not adopting. You know, being we're gonna, next time exactly. Yeah. We're going to find these guys homes. You know, you adopt one, you adopt two. You may not be able to foster anymore because now you're full at, at the house. Yeah. But by not adopting, you can take a litter here, a couple here, and a couple there all year long. So you can actually help more animals by not actually doing the adoption. But um, it's amazing how many people find coworkers and family members and neighbors down the street and such to, to find homes. Because there's a lot of times... Um, you know, we'll have, say, 11 puppies from a litter that are going to go up for adoption, and when it comes time for their adoption, there may only be two of them left. Everybody else has kind of been mm. spoken for, you know. So it's a, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and a lot of people, by having somebody, a coworker, a family member, something like that, they can stay in touch sure. with that puppy throughout right. its life. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and it's just, I was just kind of smiling as I was saying about this, because if someone just sort of isolated this part of the conversation, it'd be like, did I hear Rick <laughs> promoting not adopting an animal? But but obviously there's a much greater context. Yeah, exactly. So um, and um, so so what what are the chief reasons on the other hand? Uh, and again, whether we want to project from this 51, just because it's been sort of a little bit of a storyline here, or just otherwise, what are the chief reasons that animals don't get adopted? Well, a lot of uh, most of it is temperament. You know, and, and you know, uh, we were talking earlier. We just had a cat that had been at our shelter for just over two years. that got adopted. Maisie was an all-black cat, and they're all-black cats have a tougher time getting adopted to begin with. She was uh, dropped on her doorstep with a litter of kittens two years ago. Mm -hmm. Kittens got adopted right away, um, and she was not an easy cat to deal with. And you had to have the right people come along, and it took two years. But uh, 
a couple came in yesterday. They had lost their their cat to um, it passed away from old age, and it was just the right people. So you never know. And, yeah. You know, and that's one of the reasons why we work with them, we hold on to them, and we do everything we possibly can um, to to make them comfortable and well adjusted while we're waiting for that right person to walk in. And, sure. it, and although it doesn't happen that often that, that somebody's got to stay, stay at the shelf for a couple of years, but it does, you know. And, and how, many, uh, how many animals are, are at the facility now and what's, you know, how many, you know, could, could there be, um, you know, before you said, hey, we, we are tapped out again? Well, it, yeah. again, uh, we don't have a real big shelter and uh, you all, we almost always have 60 or 70 cats up for adoption. Uh, and we also have, you know, kittens and, and some cats with medical issues that mm -hmm. are in foster homes too. Um, most of our dogs are kept in foster homes. And like I said, we had 51, but um, there's only a couple of them that are even there at this point in time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they're out. So, um, and, and again, another good question because you just never know what's going to happen and we have to look at, um, you know, and sometimes we have to say no. You know, sure. we're at capacity. This is this is what's going on, and uh, um, and then you know, and then sometimes something, an emergency occurs that you have to help somebody out. Yeah. And then again, we call on our foster parents and such, and that's why we're constantly building that support system. Well, this this may or may not tie in, but I alluded earlier to uh, to an anecdote that that Lori Spaulding, who we're going to speak with a bit later in the show, uh, told me about just this morning that that I guess one of their volunteers was um, driving to Jacksonville. And there were eight uh, pups, I guess, kind of on the roadside, and I guess just abandoned there or whatever. So they scooped them up and, I guess, placed calls to various humane societies. So I think have kind of a new surrender-only sort of policy. Right. So they couldn't, they couldn't help out. And I guess they called you, and you instantly took those. And uh, now, what's the status of those uh, those eight? They're um, they're doing fine. They were. Flea and tick infested, I'm and sure. of course they had yeah. a lot of worms, but they were, they were pretty good shape. Oh, good. Yeah, so it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, we didn't have too many problems with them, and they were right about the right age to, uh, it was a, just a week or so, and they would have to, you know, they could go, be spayed and go up for adoption. That's great. And yeah, well, she used that as an example of, you know, the great guy that you are, and just so we need uh, more more people like you in the, uh, in the animal world. So uh, this is uh, Talking Animals. My guest is uh, Rick Shabby, Executive Director of the uh, Suncoast Animal League. If you'd like to uh, ask Rick a question, offer a comment.